let me just first of all introduce uh, the illustrious team that you have in front of you uh, this afternoon. And uh, uh, absolute pleasure uh, on our, my extreme left, your right, uh, or perhaps no, the other way around. But anyway, Ellie at the end, Ellie Noam, who's professor and director at the Institute for Teleinformation at Columbia University who emailed me last night from the bullet train in Japan and has just flown in. So he's living today twice, as far as I can work out. Uh, so very, very glad to have you here. Uh, next to Ellie, uh, we have John Bradley, um, who is the community lead for the Metaverse for the World Economic Forum, um, who is based in San Francisco. And uh, next to John, uh, we have uh, Francesca Ginexi, who is the Privacy Policy Manager uh, and uh, Legislation Specialist at Meta. And uh, right here, on my immediate right, uh, Nathaniel Fast, who's Director for the Neely Center and Associate Professor of Management um, here in LA at uh, USC Marshall School of Business. So that's your panel. A very warm welcome to all of you. So thank you, yes. So we've had a really interesting set of panels during the course of the day today. And in a sense, uh, one of the things that really st struck me as I've listened with, to the energy and the enthusiasm that so many people have expressed uh, about the metaverse is the degree to which uh, everyone kind of has assumed that it exists and that we all know what it is. Uh, which I have to say came as a bit of a surprise to me because uh, I wasn't at all sure that it existed. In fact, I was rather more certain that it existed this time last year than I am this year. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I was absolutely uh, enthralled by what everyone had to say on the subject. And so um, uh, what I thought we might do uh, when we come to think about the thorny issues of how to regulate an emerging technological area like this, one of the first questions you have to ask yourself is, do we all know what we're talking about? And as you know, in these areas of technology innovation, sometimes it can be quite hard to differentiate between those who do know what they're talking about and those who patently don't. Uh, some other people have mentioned the, um, the, the quote that says, you know, in difficult times, uh, when the tide goes out, you can see who's swimming naked. It was an excellent quote. And, um, um, you know, the tide is, well, I don't know whether it's all the way out, but it's certainly not at high tide at the moment. So uh, I think what we have uh, on our panel today are four experts whose uh, understanding, uh, whose expertise, and whose background in this area uh, is such that we might at least begin to make some definitional progress. So um, I'm going to start, uh, let's see, maybe, uh, well, let me, ask you the, let me ask you a simple question to kind of help guide you. So when we think about the metaverse and we think about uh, what it is and what it's made up of, is it, do you think, uh, a singular entity that needs regulating by different uh, people and folks and administrations around the world? Or is this actually a multiple, a plural uh, entity that we're talking about? Uh, is it something that has, is being created by multiple different kinds of entities, companies, businesses, entrepreneurs around the world, or is it going to end up as being one single environment in which everything coexists? Because understanding that is the first step to really thinking about how you might then approach regulation. So John, maybe I can start with you. Yeah, so I think uh, the, the, the full title of the initiative I'm on at the World Economic Forum is Defining and Building the Metaverse. So we, uh, we looked at this from a number of different viewpoints, and I think there's probably two answers to this question. The first one is right now there are many multiple metaverses, these tiny virtual worlds with different experiences that are teaching us about what we can do with these technologies. In the future state, I think there will be a the metaverse, which is the second generation or maybe even third generation of the World Wide Web, where all of these experiences come together in a more cohesive way. Ellie? Um, I would say that I use the word metaverse as plural rather than the somewhat pretentious metaverse capitalized, the capitalized, uh, because there are so many different sub-elements to it. And so you can have market power, for example, in part of in one segment and not in other segments. There's games, there's skill training, et cetera, et cetera. But the larger question is, why do we agonize over the definition? And people have done that, and they're forever kind of going on. There are whole articles written on the subject. What is the metaverse, and how do you define it? 
uh, but, but if you insist on a definition, my definition would be, it really it has nothing to do with, or only limited way to do with immersion and 3D, et cetera. It's more like the integration of the virtual with the real reality a tighter integration than before. And the policy conclusions from that definition are that one should focus on integration, legal integration, financial integration, transaction, personal, social, et cetera, those integrations. And if you put them all together, it means that the metaverse really should not be thought of as a revolution, not at all, but rather as a normalization namely in which we harmoniously integrate the virtual that is still somewhat separate from us, although increasingly joined, and it becomes then part of us. That's a normalization. It's much more boring than describing it as a revolution, but it is much more fundamental because it will change reality. In the past, we could dream about new realities. Now we can actually make them. So if you think about that and you think about the kinds of entities involved, are you, are you assuming, therefore, that that is a sort of organic process, Ellie, or do you think that actually that has to uh, evolve uh, or be evolved? Does it require a regulatory framework to, to make that happen, do you think, or is that something that is, is just going to happen because of market forces? Uh, um, I don't want to monopolize the conversation, so let me be brief. Uh, policy is essential to this, partly to support and partly to prevent uh, the worst, and, and partly uh, also a policy issue is not to have a regulation. That is also a policy decision. Uh, and, and here, I, I think kind of the, the, key questions, the key questions before us really are whether one should regulate in advance however, or regulate when a problem emerges. And, and the, the, the basic notion kind of tend to be that, that right now is this kind of doomsday scenario. In AI, it's even worse. And by the way, it's great that AI has been around uh, for the last year or so because it's taken a lot of the pressure off Metaverse. <laughs> Metaverse used to destroy the humanity, and now it's the AI. So we kind of have a little bit of extra. <laughs> Extra, extra kind of breathing space, uh, but but it's it's whether one should wait for a real problem to emerge or whether hypothetically one should do these things in advance. There's a lot of pressure on that, isn't yes, there? Yes, that's really interesting. So let me turn to you, Francesca, and ask you that question because, in a sense, Meta comes with uh, a whole history of engagement with with regulators and obviously with, uh, with a, uh, an enormous ambition. Um, there are those that thought for a while that the metaverse was, was being colonized by meta through your name change, but I think you've made enough statements to, to the contrary to suggest that's not quite your view. But how do you see it evolving, and how does the, the work that your company is doing, how do you see that fitting in with others? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. So as you can see, everybody has a sort of slightly a different perspective on what the metaverse is, and already in this conversation um, that's emerging. So from Meta's perspective, um, there is one single metaverse, and it is an ecosystem, right? We see it as a successor of the internet and of social connection, really an evolution of, of the current internet. And so the way we see it is, again, it's an ecosystem. It's not a singular technology is rather um, a stack of their technologies, right? It's composed by many different layers. Um, so you have, you know, the infrastructure, then you have the hardware, the software, the applications, the user behaviors. All of these are critical enabling factors that work together to build this ecosystem, right? So why I wanted to make this clarification, because obviously, you know, this definition um, has important consequences from a regulatory perspective. So if the metaverse is an evolution and a successor of the internet, that basically means that the, the regulation, the norms, the principles that already apply to the internet also apply to the metaverse. So from Meta's perspective, the metaverse really isn't being built in a regulatory vacuum. Actually, there are rules, there are norms that apply to it. So all the, the laws and uh, frameworks and guidelines that apply to the internet also apply to the metaverse. Um, 
to, to your point um, regarding whether it is going to be by a single entity, um, no, the metaverse is not going to be built by a single entity at all. Actually, it's going to be the uh, product uh, collaboration of multiple different stakeholders. So we'll have, um, you know, industry. We have um, small, small and medium businesses. We'll have governments, civil society, public sector. They all collaborate and creators. Obviously, they'll all build the metaverse together, piece by piece, just like the internet was built, right? What's really important here is that there needs to be sort of a baseline agreement um, as to um, some technical standards um, that um, need to be agreed upon, basically. Because without some baseline level of interoperability, the risk that we run is as these different experiences, as these different pieces of the metaverse are built, they will become impenetrable from one another. And that's not what we want. We don't want a fragmented metaverse. We don't want metaverse being built in silos. Rather, we want some baseline level of interoperability. But that, that is what we have at the moment, in a way, isn't it? We have, we have a, a set of, of kind of kind of early stage, kind of, if I can call them, kind of, you know, fetal stage uh, metaverse incarnations, so Roblox or, or Fortnite or, you know, your own uh, products, that they, they all are quite discreet from one another and they don't use the same standards, there's no interoperability between them. Yeah, that's where I think, you know, if we think about is there an area where regulation can actually be helpful here, is not hard law that I'm thinking about, it's more these idea of technical standards and principles um, and having this fora with multiple stakeholders deciding upon those, I think that's a really pressing issue and that's, that should be at the forefront when we think about regulation. Uh, I'm, Nate, I'm going to come to you in just a minute, but let me just ask you one more question, Francesca, on that. Is, is it your view from from a meta perspective, that uh, the market is taking care of itself effectively at the moment from your point of view, or do you think that government intervention would be useful? So I think that whenever we talk about emerging technology and, you know, in this case specifically the metaverse, um, like we can never think about regulation as coming from one side. It needs necessarily to be a multi-stakeholder approach, right? Um, I think um, regulators and industry and civil society, academia should all collaborate if we want to deliver regulatory outcomes that are conducive to innovation, that are conducive to actually the creation of the metaverse that, that we want, right? Um, so um, yeah, I'm, it, it necessarily needs to be a multi-stakeholder, multi-perspective approach. Right, right. So Nate, let me ask you, you come to this with a, with a, a neutral academic perspective as well, um, like, somewhat like Ellie. I mean, what's your view of the, the both where we actually are and, and the degree to which that is uh, something that maybe needs adjusting or whether actually, you know, the market forces are doing just fine? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good, it's an interesting conversation and I think it's, we're still at the stage where it's important to have a lot of healthy debate and conversation about what the metaverse should, should become and I think to some degree it's unfolding in a way that none of us can really control. I think, I see the metaverse as kind of an integrated um, set of experiences that build bridges between um, more immersive experiences that we can have and reality. And so I see it more of an, as an extension of reality or an interaction with reality. And so for that reason, it's hard for me to think about it as the next version of the internet in some ways because it's going to be more um, connected to both you know, the, the, the internet that we have now and the experiences that we have on the internet now and also the experiences that we have in in the real world, and so, um, so I think you know it's it's yet to be determined how it plays out, um, but I see it in that way. And we recently had a conference at the Neely Center where we brought together some of the world's leading you know scholars and researchers from academia. And I'll just say one of the things that I was impressed with is all of the purpose-driven experiences that are being developed and the value-based you know the value-driven kind of experiences in augmented and virtual reality. And so, however those get you know, woven together in a way that uh, brings value to the to the consumer. I think that's that's exciting um, to me, and so it'll be fun to see how that unfolds. It, it's a, it's really interesting, isn't it? And I think we'll, I mean we should come on to this, which is the, the, really this question of 
the, the different kind of functions and the, actually the different aspects of, of what might become uh, the metaverse, which are on the one hand, you know, what we're seeing at the moment, which is largely games oriented and entertainment based. Uh, there's obviously a social media aspect of it, but then as you say, there are also these, these really purposeful, you know, pro-societal uh, and, and also industrial applications, all of which can coexist in this one environment. Do we really think that that one environment is capable of sustaining all of those things? And is that actually what we should be uh, thinking towards? John? Yeah, I think uh, those applications already exist. Like there's a diversity of applications and they're using the same sort of architecture and display technologies, right? So I think they can coexist. I just think the needs are gonna be very different for each of those applications and use cases. And the good news is I think there's a bit more history actually in industrial metaverse applications through VR over the years than there is actually in consumer applications. So people doing 3D visualization and models, that's something that's been around for decades. So what people need is a little bit more concrete, I think, just having been on that side at several private companies. So I think that will take care of itself in its own way, right? Because there's industry need, it's, it's clearly brought back to the companies doing policy and delivering product. Um, I think the more difficult thing to look at is consumers, because they they have different needs. It's a very personal thing. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? The, the the laser beam of regulatory attention was probably turned on the metaverse when cryptocurrency was the thing that was driving uh, everyone's understanding of it most powerfully, right? And that we all understand and know what's happened to that uh, in the past 12 months. Do you think that, and, and at the same time, obviously, we've seen the enormous upsurge in interest in generative AI, and the regulatory eye, if you like, is, is pointed in that direction, and there's probably a bandwidth question here as about how much any regulator can actually cope with. But is, is that the way that the regulatory kind of framework should evolve? Is it just a sort of a knee-jerk reaction to the kind of moral panic about what consumer peril might be encouraged by this, the latest evolution of the, of the latest technology platform? And is, is, that, is that a desirable approach, or is that just the inevitability of, uh, of a kind of political environment? Ellie. Uh, there is, uh, and, and there's a little bit of a difficult way to hear you. The mics are somehow not terribly um, clear. but as far as I can hear the question. I think it's important to uh, distinguish between the problems that we observe and the motivation for regulation. And the two are not necessarily the same. Some might just be kind of a pretext. In the, in the case of uh, metaverse and AI regulation, the lead uh, the region is the Brussels Commission in Europe, and there have been a whole range of things that they have proposed and done and enacted and passed along um, and spread. And, and so anything that has to do with metaverse has to be seen in that broader context. And the broader context is that Europe has not been terribly successful in its own technology relative to China and the United States. And so while China and the United States are exporting technology, Europe is exporting regulations. Um, and and, and you, can, you can see this on a whole range of things, not just on AI and metaverse, but also on the um, domestic production quota for content that is being streamed on the uh, taxation, the Ireland type situation. Well, there, there are those that would say that, the, the, that those initiatives are designed to protect consumers in a way that the market economy in the US apparently is not. So there well, is definitely a historical well, distinction there. Isn't if, there? You, if you continue looking through, through, that, through that list and the list keeps growing, <laughs> it, uh, the consumers are being, of course, being mentioned in the forefront. But the question is whether that's really, whether there is a subtext there. And I think the subtext is, and I think some of the developing world is also uh, approaching this, is to see these uh, large platforms who happen to be, for Europeans happily in that sense, uh, not European but American, as a cash cow um, for various uh, policy goals. Uh, the end result for Europe has been a slower innovation. Um, and the kind of the, the danger for the United States by going the same route is that we also will fall behind 
uh, slowly against, against other countries such as China, such as Korea, etc., that don't are not held back by the same considerations. Now, I'm not. I, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that legitimate regulation should not be quite forcefully implemented, but but the goal has to be in some ways to deal with a specific problem rather than a hypothetical problem. So, Francesca, let me ask you. So you, you, from a meta perspective, you're thinking globally. You're having to negotiate the initiatives coming from the US government and from the EU and, and, and other parts of the world. When you look at that kind of landscape of, of different flavors of initiative, what, you know, how, I mean, first of all, how do you see it? I mean, do you, do you recognize what Ellie, uh, Ellie's characterization there? Um, and what do you do about it? Is, is how are you operating in that environment? Are there parts of, of parts of what's coming out of Europe, for example, that, that, that are actually uh, things that you want to encourage? Yeah, I mean, as I said, from our perspective, regulation already applies to the metaverse. So, you know, all the challenges and the, you know, the rules that uh, we've implemented with respect to the internet continue to apply to the metaverse. So obviously there are and there may be novel issues that come up because it is an emerging field. Um, so these questions, to, to the extent that they do arise, I think they will need to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis, right? And I think I align with the Ellie on this particular point in the sense that you need to look at the single problem, not just regulate the technology just um, you know, in itself, because no, te no technology is inherently good or bad, right? Um, so I think, um, generally speaking, from what I've seen from the European Union perspective, um, you know, the Commission and the Parliament both issued uh, communications on virtual worlds. Uh, they don't talk necessarily about metaverse, but rather on virtual worlds. So basically, the experience that built up the metaverse, and they seem to confirm this idea that you know existing regulation already applies to it. Uh, what's interesting and kind of connects to your point about how we look at the industrial aspect of it versus the consumer aspect is that there is um you know, a lot of conversation um, um, re regarding how to foster innovation, how to foster um, economic growth. So I feel like overall the metaverse is seen as an opportunity, not only by industry, but also by regulators. And so there is this trend towards, you know, how can we make sure that the workforce is trained, that, you know, people are skilled, and so how can we make sure that we support small and medium businesses to innovate in this particular space? But, it, but on the other hand, you know, to take Ellie's point that he made earlier, you know, no, if, if regulation should only happen when an issue arises to regulate, uh, you might look at the history of, of uh, data usage coming out of, of Meta, uh, and you know Cambridge Analytica is the thing that everyone is going to mention, right? And it would not be a stretch to imagine that similar kinds of data abuse could occur in a metaverse environment as well. So are you saying that it doesn't matter because the regulation already exists and we dealt with it before. Obviously, we didn't deal with it before it happened. But you're saying that's OK and we're, the metaverse will, will be a, just as well covered by existing regulation. Well, I mean, what I'm saying is that there may be areas where new regulation is required, and there may be areas where there are issues that are not covered by regulation right now, but where regulation is not necessarily the right answer, right? There are other things that can come into play. Best practices, a voluntary code of conduct, um, you know, technical standards, principles, and things like that. So I think, like, to the extent of these issues and these questions arise, we should look at whether regulation is indeed, you know, metaverse-specific regulation is indeed the answer here, right? Um, in terms of what you mentioned um, about you know privacy issues and all that, I think Meta has been doing um, you know our, we've been doing our homework. We've learned a lot of lessons from from you know our past experiences with other products and services, and we really think about the metaverse in a lens of responsible innovation. We have four responsible innovation principles that really have privacy at their core, and so we bake a privacy review process from the ground up to the development of all. Our, um, products um, and so I think there's a lot of lessons learned from you know the history of the internet until now not only from our perspective but in general um, and those will you know will, will have a great impact you know yes. the metaverse yes. I mean it's interesting isn't it? I mean, uh, some of you may have been in a panel earlier on today with a bunch of marketing folk who spent a lot of time talking about the immense amount of personal data um, that issuing various NFT type products to consumers was going to elicit and how incredibly 
powerful that would be and how, what a great relationship that would, in, would then power between themselves and those individual consumers. And there's no question that the, the, the volume of data coming off virtual environments is going to be considerably greater um, than the, the level of data coming off just pure social media in its current form in a Web 2.0 shape, right? So, Nate, from, from your point of view, it, does that, if we just think about it as a pure kind of volume, numbers of points of contact, the amount of personal dense data that's be going to become uh, manipulable, does that represent a significant change, do you think? I mean, is that something that, that in terms of of wanting to progress in this field, um, we should be worried about. Well, um, yeah, I think I think we should be cautious about these things. We should be excited about it and um, and excited about the things that we're building. We should always also be cautious about the things that we're um, building. And um, I think this is one case where there are a lot of potential dangers involved. Um, and I think for for me, I don't love. Policy. I don't like. I. It's. There's not a like a, a perfect solution to this. Um, I do think we need guardrails, but I also think um, companies have to be able to do what they do, and they have to be able to innovate. And so it's kind of a. It's a balancing act. It's very difficult, and it's very difficult on both sides. But especially for policymakers to try to to govern in in pot, in wise ways when this um, stuff is moving so fast. And so, <clears throat> to me, I think, I think to be successful in this metaverse um, or set of experiences that we're building, we need to earn trust of users and earn trust of society. And um, whether that's enforced through policy or whether that's um, adopted as best practices, I don't think it really matters as long as we're doing that and as long as we're earning um, that trust. We're not starting from tabula rasa, though, are we? No. <laughs> we are where we are with no. the history that we've had. So that's right. That's right. Yeah. And, I, and, and I think to earn the trust, um, I think the key to that is transparency. And so I think that is something that could be um, a step in the right direction. Um, so maybe it's not as, um, you know, it, it's one step in the right direction of, of saying we need to be transparent about the data. And I think consumers and users need to understand that when we put on a headset, there's a vastly more information that's collected. And it doesn't work if we don't collect that data. Like, it has to be collected as part of the user experience itself. Mm -hmm. But then we also need to be um, transparent about what do the companies do with that data? What, uh, who do they share the data with? What kind of controls do consumers have over their data? And I think those are things that we, at the very least, need to be um, transparent about in order to kind of have the further conversation about like what those decisions but How do we really be? approach that problem? Because the, the answer can't be a 164-page EULA document that you sign before you register for, the, for access, right? I mean, that, that at the moment is the solution to transparency from a, from a lawyer's perspective. Oh, it's in the, it was in the EULA. You signed up for it, so you, you knew, right? I mean, that, that, that may work from a legal, technical perspective, but in terms of genuinely creating trust, in consumers, that's, that isn't the solution. So, so you know, given the, the kind of checkered history that we've got, I don't know, Francesca, well, I mean, uh, you know, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here, but, but you know, inevitably, perhaps, you're used to being asked these sorts of questions, but, you know, I mean, the, you, you have a particular problem, right? You know, you are there with the history of what's happened uh, with, with Facebook over the years, um, with the agglomeration of all those different data sources. What's your... What's the solution to this? Because in a sense, none of us want to have regulation prevent innovation. And yet at the same time, there's a, there's a huge gap of, of, of trust and credibility, I suppose, that you've still got to bridge. So. I think that um, is a conversation we should have as a society, and we should um, have a lot of uh, you know, the public weighing in, which is like why I think the transparency is incredibly important. We should, um, you know, citizens need to understand kind of what what happens with their data. And I think with the first wave of social media, we didn't understand that. Users didn't understand how that works. I think with Metaverse, we have the opportunity to kind of elevate the digital literacy of our society and have a debate about that, um, about what happens to uh, data. Should should Meta Meta has to um, to record, you know, or to to process a lot of data uh, about us in order to create products? Should they keep that data forever? Um, what should they use? Can they sell it? What about a startup? I think these are incredible, they are, they very are really, good questions. Really interesting questions. Of course, I mean, the general data protection regulations in Europe require companies to behave in a very specific way and to reveal how much data they hold uh, and to be able to agree to treat it in particular ways. None of those rules apply here in the US that has a much more free market approach 
And uh, that, I think you, you, you have not necessarily had an answer, Sandy, but at least you've had an airing of the question. Well, I think, I think one step would be that I think users should be able to delete their data um, easily enough, you know, I mean, I think that that's one step in the right direction is having control over being able to delete, uh, to delete their data that has been collected. Uh, I think here too, technology can make a real, real difference. It doesn't have to be law, it doesn't have to be a regulation, although I'm, I'm not against it at all. I've written in that, in that vein 25 years ago and I was a public service commission for New York, we instituted, and I wrote them the first regulations in tele, privacy regulation for telecom. So I'm on board here. But there are technologies that can help us. AI should not be understood only as something that big companies, the Amazons and the Metas or whatever, kind of deploy, but it's also for, by consumers or by companies that provide services to consumers as a protective tool, as a shield, as a way in which they can keep their information to only the, uh, uh, protect the information that they have and don't give it out to, uh, to the outside vendors. Uh, and so, so in that sense, AI can be your friend, not your enemy. Yes, I mean, it's very interesting, isn't it? There's so, so much attention on AI at the moment. Um, but using AI to be our own defense against the things that undefended AI right. might invent seems like a, a, yeah. a really powerful direction to take. Um, we've, we've got virtually no time left at all. There's a question here about how much role government is playing um, in all of this, but I think the answer to that is, well, the governments keep a close eye on this all around the world, but there's a, a varying degrees of intervention. Um, in the last moments, let me, Francesca, let me just ask you, what, if you had one wish about the way in which regulation and policy would develop over the next couple of years, what would it be? Um, I think three things. Um, regulation should be risk-based, so really think about the harms that we're trying to prevent and technology neutral, so not think about technology as good or bad, but rather look at the harms and the possible risk scenarios. Um, continue doing evidence-based, such as the programs that I mentioned before, and multi-stakeholder regulation, um, and really have regulation that is very narrowly tailored so that you don't over-scope it and accidentally go and, you know, grab other perfectly, you know, non-risky use cases and, like, inadvertently hinder innovation. So those three elements, I think, so are really pro important. pro-innovation regulation, is that a meaningful term, do you think? I think regulation can be pro-innovation, um, or at least can favor innovation. It doesn't need to restrict it necessarily, but you need to find the right balance. Excellent. We're out of time. Ellie, John, Francesca, Nate. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. My name's Jeremy Silver. Thank you for listening. Thank you.